chapter number 6, verse number 1 says this. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worths of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus says, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remain over and above unto them that had eaten. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, as we come to you, Lord, we're grateful for another opportunity to get into thy word. Lord, thank you for allowing us to come to the house of God. Lord, I make mention this often that it's a privilege and an honor to come to the house of God here this morning. Lord, there's people all over the world don't have the freedoms we have here to come to church. And Lord, they'd love to be here to sit under the preaching of the word just one good time. Now, Lord, I pray we wouldn't take for granted what you have for us here this today. And Lord, we're asking that you'd move amongst us in this service. Lord, we need you this morning. Lord, I need you. Lord, I cannot do that. What is set before me, Lord, you know my ability, it's very little. Lord, my ability can take me so far, but it'll end. But Lord, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So, Lord, I'm asking, would you touch this old vessel of clay here this morning? Lord, I'm just your messenger is all I am. And Lord, I've come to deliver that which you laid on my heart. And Lord, I pray that you'd use it for your glory and honor. Lord, I pray that our hearts are prepared to receive what you have for us. Lord, I pray you'd touch the hearts of your people just one more time. Lord, if there's somebody here this morning that does not know you through the free pardon of sin, Lord, I'm asking that this would be the glad day that individual would be birthed into the family of God, a spouse adopted. Lord, it's the only thing I know that you get all three at one time in one, in one, one moment. Lord, I pray that you'd deal with that individual, maybe a boy or girl, mom or dad, aunt, uncle or grandma or grandpa, Lord, whoever it may be. Lord, I pray that you'd save that individual this morning. Now, Lord, I pray you just touch the furtherance of this service. Lord, I pray you touch my heart, my mind, and my lips. And, Lord, they be in tune with you. Lord, I pray you'd hedge us in here this week. And, Lord, that you'd allow us just to bask in the good things of God here this week. Lord, we'll praise you for what you do. For we'd ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Y'all may be seated. Thank you very much. This is the story of the feeding of the, of the 5,000. But I want to look at a thought here this morning. God, I don't want to hinder the work. God, I do not want to hinder the work. And can I tell you, we've got a lot of hindrance today in the work of God. We've got a lot of hindrance that hinders the services that we have. And sometimes we carry extra baggage in the house of God that's never meant to be carried in. And as we're about to enter in, and I'm praying that God will bring, bring revival, and this just won't be just days of meetings but I'm praying that God would just definitely breathe upon the services this morning, tonight, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, and whatever else God has in store for us. But I'm telling you, I'm, I'm going to ask that, that, that you listen to this message, not because I'm preaching it, but something that can help us here this morning, and I pray it will help us this week. And sometimes we'll come into meetings, and we'll be carrying extra things, and our minds will drift and wander across things that we didn't get accomplished, things that need to be done at the house, and things that need to take place and different things, and I understand that, but I'm asking that we wouldn't hinder the work that God has for us this week and what God would have us to do. So I want to just look at that thought, God, I do not want to hinder the work. Number one, we see where there's a, a, a place that's come, and there's a, I, I mentioned this as a difficulties in the mind of, of man, but not in the mind of God. And we see that there's a multitude here, and it says in verse number two, there's a great multitude following him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, 
that were diseased. And, of course, there's a lot of people that's fallen in the name of Christ, but they don't know who Christ really is. We've got those just like Benny Hinn and different others that are walking around and they're doing it in the name of Christ, but they don't know who Jesus really is. We've got the Pope that just come to America and they followed him around just because he's a man and they say that he's doing miracles and different things and they're falling around. And he did use the name of Christ a couple times in one of his messages or whatever you want to call that. He, he did or just a speech is what I call it. It's all he did. Stood before the people and just gave an, an eloquent speech, speech and he told them Jesus is in your pots and pans and the crowds went crazy and they followed this man just because they think he can do miracles and they, and they, and they do this in the name of Christ and so that's the same that's going on in here. There's a multitude following Christ because of the miracles he did and so we see their mind as they were following him because of all that the Lord is doing and then we see their meandering. They're just wandering about from here to here just following Jesus and that's can I tell you that's happening in our Baptist churches today? We got people that are meandering around from church to church, from church to church, and they say, well, God's not moving in this church, so I'm going to go down to the church down the road because it seems like God's moving. Can I tell you all they're doing is meandering around. They're just going from place to place to place. I don't believe God meant for the church to be like that. And so we see that difficulty in the mind of man, but not in the mind of God. But then we see the doubters. And this is, I want to take a look at this, and I want to look at three individuals in this story. Number one, I want to look at the doubters. We're going to look at Philip. And he comes and he asks Philip, of course, every time that Jesus lifted up his eyes and the crowd come to him, I'm thankful that God had compassion on him. I mean, even this morning, God's having compassion on us here this morning. And he, and he looked up, he lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto them. In verse number 5, and he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. And so we see the motive. We see God's motive in this. And he looked upon the people. Can I tell you, that should be our motive for everything we do for Christ as people? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I mean, I, that's the whole drive of what I do. It's not so that my name can be heard or my name can be seen or anything else like that. I'm here to lift up the name of Christ and I'm here to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ looking under the author and the finish of our faith. That's my whole duty this week is to compliment what the pastor's been preaching for years and also to point the people to Christ. And so we see his motive and of God is the people and he's looking upon the people and he asks Philip, he says, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? And of course we see the motion list of Philip because he's always counting the cost. We got people counting the cost all the time. The man of God will come up and says, I really believe this is what we need to do. And it never fails. Somebody will start thinking about how much we got in the bank, how much we got here, how much our tithes is and all that stuff. Can I tell you, that's not what God sent us here to do. There's some people counting this week already about coming to church 7 o'clock at night and I'm being nice and I'm not being mean I'm just being honest. But we got people that's already counting the cost this week knowing that they're going to have to come on Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. It's going to be 7 o'clock. Now the time's went back an hour. It's going to get dark at 5.30. It's going to rain. It's going to do this. And we got other things. And people are already counting. Am I coming or am I not coming? Am I right? Boy, it's just like Philip. That's what Philip is. Always counting the cost. Philip, he is one of those. He is already counting the cost. And he says 200 penny worth is not sufficient for if they was just to take a little. And what we see that the meaningless, the worthlessness of it, he says, God, God, what I have is very worthless. There's people saying, God, what I have ain't going to add much to the service. What you have may be the very thing God used to break this service. We need people to quit counting the cost on the, on the things that's going on about the things. And can I tell you what you're doing? You're doubting God. I mean, could you imagine Philip looking at the God, the creator of everything, the Jesus who created the, this earth that you're standing on and everything that we have that we're living in and this piece of ground that you're sitting on and this building that we're coming into? Don't you realize God knew that this was going to be here before he even formed the world? I mean, and, and you're saying what we have is very worthless? I'm telling you, we need to quit counting the cost. We've got too many Philips in our churches today trying to figure out how we're going to do this and how we're going to do that and looking at God says, well, God, I just don't think you can. Can I tell you, God's still on the throne in 2015. I still believe he can and he can do some things that are exceeding abundantly above. So number one, we don't need no doubters to hinder the work. Number two, we don't need discouragers. In verse number, seven, uh, verse number uh, eight, it says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But... 
What are, what are they among so many? A discourager. And so we see. Do we, I, now let me. I'll give this to Philip. He is looking for people to bring to Christ. Every time you find Andrew, not Philip, but Andrew in the Bible, he's always going to go get somebody. He's always bringing somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know how he did it amongst five, almost 5,000 men. That ain't counting the women and children. But boy, he went to scouring that crowd, went to looking. That's what we need some folks this week to start looking to bring some people to church this week. And so we're looking and we're trying to find somebody. And he sat and finds this little old lad, had a little lunch. And he says, you mind coming with me? I mean, I can just imagine how this is going. And says, well, what are you going to do with that? And Andrew went back and gave a report to Jesus. He says, there's a little lad here has five barley loaves, two small fishes, but. And so we see that he's looking, and he says, they're just little loaves, little fishes. Little loaves, little fishes, not much, Lord. You can't do anything with that. I mean, look at the number. Maybe even old Andrew got with Philip. Maybe they had a little old yeah, yeah meeting behind doors. They must have probably good Baptists. Always everybody's having them little meetings behind the pastor's back. Say amen right there. And so we got to that there, yeah, yeah, and said, well, how much you got, Phil? Well, I got 200 penny worth, it's just about eight months' wages, but that's not enough. He said, what do you got, Andrew? Well, I found a little lad, he has five little blows and two small fishes, about that big. Now, if they was up the mountains, that fish would be this big. Yeah. But he said, I got little fishes and lo loaves of bread. He said, that's all I can come up with. That's it, Andrew, that's it. How about you? That's all I got. Well, let's go talk to Jesus. And so they come, and they talk to Jesus. He said, you know, I found a little lad here, Jesus. He just got... Five loaves, two small fish. Now, could you imagine looking in the eyes of Christ and telling him that? But can I tell you, that's exactly what's going on. We got people looking at, you know, Lord, five loaves, two fishes. That's all it is. Can I tell you, you're trying to discourage the one that can do everything. There's no telling what God will do this week if we've tried to quit discouraging God and having meetings. I'm not here to discourage him. I'm needing me. Amen. 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 And there's probably somebody going to is probably going to discourage it and probably say, "You going to the meeting? Well, you know, I don't know. I, I just got so much to do. Can you do that in the dark?" Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Like those that give God the God give him the excuse, I need to go. To look at a piece of ground, but it was at night, I believe it was. And by the way, the meal was at supper time, which was at dark. And so we see we got the discouragers, and he talked about how little it was, the littleness. But I, I want to look at number, number four, the delay of it. The delay of it. With us discouraging and doubting God, we are delaying our giving. And we see the thing that they delayed in. They delayed in surrender. Well, we got so many people that's delaying in your surrender of giving everything to God. There's no telling what God would do this week if we would not delay our surrender. Amen. You're delaying it. And you sitting here counting the cost, trying to, trying to discourage God from using you, you are delaying your surrender to what God would have you to do. I don't need anybody delaying their surrender. There's people in here that don't need you delaying your surrender. We need some folks that will be willing to say, God, whatever you want me to do, that's exactly what I want to do. Whatever you want me to say, I'll do that, God. Well, there's probably somebody, probably should have given a testimony this morning, but this is probably about how it went. Well, I just don't want to kill the service. And they, they leave and they say, and, I, and I've had people do this, preacher, I missed it this morning. About what? Oh, God was telling me to say something, and I didn't, and now I feel so bad. Can I tell you what they just did? They delayed their surrender. You may be the very key that opens this service up this morning, but you delayed it, and now we're having to wait a little bit longer for what you delayed on. And so we see a delayed in surrender. Delayed in giving. Delayed in giving. He didn't, they didn't give what they had. They were already manipulating in their mind how to discourage God, doubt God, and they were trying to explain to themselves, well, if I do this, well, I don't know if it's me or God wanting me to do this. Well, I just don't know if it's this or that and the other thing. I can tell you, you can tell when God's in it or not. Yeah. You've been around the things of God long enough, you know when God's in it or not. Amen. Well, you delayed your giving. And number two, or number three, you delayed supplying. I'm going to come back to that one at the end of the service. So I want, we see the, the, the doubter, the discourager, the delay. But I want to look at the diligence. The diligence. Here we see we had a little lad. 
had five loaves, two small fishes. And evidently, Andrew brought him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that little lad, number one, he had to receive his bread and fishes from somebody. Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about the gospel. I was, I was preaching on that yesterday. He says, I'm going to give you that which I received. But you'll never give anything to somebody until you receive it. And can I tell you, there's some folks probably received some things from God this week. You haven't given it like God told you to. You didn't release what God gave you, that little lad. He got it from somebody. Now, I don't know if he got his five loaves and two small fishes from his mom or not. The Bible doesn't say, but he received that from somebody. I don't know if he bought it on the market. I mean, I'm just going to probably just go on Robertology and probably say he might have got it from mom. Being a little lad, had to get it from somebody with authority. And so there's a good possibility he got it from his mom, five loaves, two small fishes. And so we see where that little lad, he received it, but then the little lad relocated it. He had to bring it from somebody and bring it and relocate it. And he relocated that. And then not only that, when he relocated it, he relinquished it. Us humans have a hard time doing this. We have a hard time letting go. I'm, I'm afraid that if rapture takes place, we're going feet first, most of us. Because we don't want to let go of what God, you know. And that's about the way it's probably going to go. Because we don't want to let go of nothing, amen. I'm telling you, it's about time we let go of some things that God's given us and relinquished it and put it in the hands of one that can do more with it than we can. Amen. So we see he relinquished it, but then we see the Lord distributed that. And it says right here, and it says, and the Lord took the loaves. It means he received them. Can I tell you, you're wanting God to bless what you have, but can I tell you, God will never bless the things that you'll never give him? If you never give yourself to God, how can God bless you? And you know, you want God to bless your money, and you never give it to him. How do you expect God to bless your money? Yeah. Amen. I mean, there's some of you, God's give you some singing ability. Uh-oh. I felt that one. I did. Somebody's got some, probably singing ability. I felt that stuff right there. Somebody in here, God's give you some singing ability. But you won't give to God what God gives you. God can never bless it. Your wallet, yourself. I mean, have you give everything to God and let him take it? And God, God is a gentleman. He's not going to rip it out of your hands. He's only going to take it to what you give him. Probably somebody in here serving out of drudgery. Some probably already dreading this week. God may have something for you, but you won't give it to him so that he can bless it. It says the Lord took it, and it says not only did he receive it, but he recognized it. He gave thanks for it. He lifted it up. Oh, that God would recognize something that I have, amen. Boy, there ain't no telling what's in here inside this church building here this morning that God's waiting for you to give it to him. And think about that. He lifted it up to heaven, and he recognized what he had in his hand. Oh, I want God to take what I have is very little that I've got and just bless it like he can. Amen. Amen. Some of y'all probably need to give your children to the Lord. Amen. Probably some of y'all need to give yourself to the Lord and ask God to bless what you've got. Amen. And so we see he recognized it, but then the Lord rationed it. After he gave thanks, he distributed it unto his disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And so they took it out there and they started to give out what God gave them. Yeah, good, and then we see the dusting of it. The dusting of it. And then I'm going to come back to one more point. The dusting of it. Can I tell you, God is not in wasting time. Dusting means cleaning up. Can I tell you, we're wasting a lot of God's time? He says, after they've eaten, he says, gather them together and they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. God's not into wasting. Can I tell you, we don't have time. Number one, he's not in for us to waste in his time. Can I tell you, that's what we do. We waste time. Amen. You're, you're, 
I got to be careful too. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach myself under the fence. We waste a lot of time on these. Right here. I mean, we do. God, I don't have time to pray. But I have time to Twitter. Some of y'all probably don't even know what Twitter is. You know? And there ain't nothing wrong with these things. I, I, I have a little Twitter account, and every now and then I'll put a Bible verse up. But man, them things can consume you. I didn't know y'all had a Facebook page. I don't have Facebook, but I realized y'all had one yesterday. Well, I appreciate that message. We need revival. That's good. But I'm telling you, we're wasting God's time watching TV. Hello? Oprah don't have all the answers, and she's a cult anyway. Some of y'all caught on, caught the light bulb. But we're wasting time. Read another magazine. Probably shock us how very little prayer went into this meeting. We give everything we got to this old world and our jobs. And then when it comes to the end of the day, we're so tired we can't give God nothing. Amen. I take the first part of the morning and spend it with him. I find it to be my best time. Get in that Bible and read and pray. It's amazing what you can do in the first hour of the day if you just give it to God. And then spend some time with them during the day and spend some time with them at night. I love them middle night wake up calls from God. He gave me one this morning. About 3 o'clock this morning, he woke me up. I just rolled over, just prayed a little while, and by, I just prayed myself to sleep. Don't feel guilty about that at all. I just was praying to God and asking God to help this morning and asking God to give the message for the morning and asking God just to meet with us this morning asking God to do a work this morning asking God to save an individual this morning. I'm telling you, we got to quit wasting God's time. But when God wakes us up in the middle of the night, most of us says, I'll get you in the morning, God. We're wasting time. Not only are we wasting time, we're wasting God's talent. God's given us so much in America to do with, and it seems like we're getting very little done. I go over in Egypt, and I was in Egypt back in July, and we were I had a preacher's conference there, and we preached, I think there was over 300 people in them meetings that would fill in the room, and they were standing outside looking in the windows. 104 degree temperatures. Preaching until I was wringing wet. My suits were literally just wringing wet with sweat, preaching, and then when he got done, they said, is that all you got? Well, I'm done wrong, wet, tired, fatigued. I'm done. We need more. Oh, if we'd get that hunger back in America that they come for hours on a time on a bus ride to come hear a white man come preach and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ and they don't want to waste what they got. They want to take what they have and give it out to their country in Egypt. Amen. God has given us so much and we're doing so little here in America. Boy, I feel a touch on that. Boy, not only are we wasting God's talent, we're wasting God's table. This right here. That right there, that bread of life. Oh, who are we getting it out to? Who have you passed out a track to this week? Who have you told about the love of God this week? We're so free. I was in Egypt, uh, and this guy on a Thursday night, was this pastor was just crying and before the service, and I said, what's wrong with him? And that interpreter says, they just locked his church up. The government did. And he's weeping over his church, he says, and they won't allow him to open it back up. And I said, what's he going to do? He says, they'll meet somewhere else. He says, they'll carry on. But boy, they built that work up and the government just put a padlock on it and says they can't go there no more. But yet they don't stop them from coming to the house of God. And I've often wondered our mountain churches, if they were to padlock our doors, would we really find a place to go meet with God or would we go to the house? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Boy, we're wasting God's table. I don't want to hinder God's work. I don't want to hinder it this week. If we're going to hinder his work this week, then we're just meeting in vain. I need something from God. And I want to go back to a point that I left off. How we delayed in that supply. And I don't think I'm going to do any harm to the scripture. But if I am, Brother Coach, please correct me. But he come to Philip first. 
Philip says 200 penny worth of bread, not sufficient. They would just take a little. And I thought about that. What would have happened if Philip would have given the money? Can I tell you what I really think would have happened if Philip would have given him the money? And I'm not correcting that King James Bible. It's perfect and inspired, preserved word of God that we have. But if Philip would have given, I believe, and would have went and got 200 penny worth of bread, he never would have met the lad and gave him anything. God wouldn't. And I tell you, appreciate the lad and the little one. Yes, Fed a lot of people on a little piece of ground. Yes. And I've often wondered, what did Philip say? Because I believe he got the first basket. I've often wondered what Philip said after feeding them 5,000. What would have happened if I had given that much? Yes. <clears throat> Lord wouldn't have had to have that. Had everything he needed. God could have multiplied that 200 penny worth just as easy as he took them five loaves and two fishes. I wonder that chain jangling in his pocket for Philip. I wonder how they sounded. I wonder if it tormented him. I wonder when he had that old bag. I wonder if it bothered him. Wonder if that money boy just didn't have that enticing draw to it as it used to. Knowing that God could have used what he had. Do you realize if Philip would have given that 200 penny worth, he never would have been introduced to a little lad? I wonder what we have in here. If God's wanting to use, but he's got to go to somebody else. But when I saw this for the first time, got on my knees and I asked God to forgive me. How many times did God want to use what I had? But I talked my way out of it and I didn't doubt it. Lord, that's monumental. I don't know if I can do that. What is it this week that you've got? God's already pointed it out right now. And I don't have to call out anything, but God's already pointed some things out here this morning. God's saying, I'm wanting you. And you're saying, I don't want to give it. It's not enough. Lord, I don't want to give it. It's not sufficient enough. Lord, I don't want to give it because it just seems so insignificant to somebody else. That widow might seem insignificant, but God sure did recognize that she gave all she had. I'm wondering who in here this morning God's wanting to use to give what you have to him. And let us watch a miracle before our eyes. All you've got to do is give it up. Quit doubting. Quit discouraging. And then quit delaying the supply. Because while they were meandering around trying to talk God out of it, there was 5,000 men plus women and children waiting on that supply. wonder how long it took. Was it an hour? Could have been a couple of hours. But either way, there's 5,000 people waiting. Wait. We have what they need, but they're waiting. I, I had no intention of complaining, but it was. But we went to Michigan this summer. And the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is where I'm originally from. Don't let that bother you. I'm a half back. I went from Florida to Went from Michigan to Florida and only made it halfway back. But I went back to my old home. And 
I went up there on service. We pulled in the little old business, and I said, let's go check and see what this is about. We walked in, and the lady said, can I help you? I said, I'm reminiscing. I said, what are you reminiscing about? I said, well, Mr. Lister. She said, where at? I said, Brown House Cross Church. She says, what's your name? I told her. She left me and my wife and our two children in that store by ourselves, and she just walked out. I told the girls, I said, whatever you want, I'm a house girl, just pack her up. Okay? <laughs> but she finally come back with a man. And this man come up to me and says, so you're Uncle Bill's grandson. I said, Uncle Bill, he said, Bill O'Neill. I said, that's my grandpa. I said, that's my uncle. I didn't know. So we talked for a little while with this couple. And that lady asked my wife, says, what does your husband do? She says, he's an evangelist. He preaches all over the world. That lady looked at my wife and reverberates every morning in my heart when I wake up. She says, that without fail the first thing I hear. When I go to bed, it's usually about the last thing I call you. She looked at my wife and this lady and her husband speaking and probably thinking this. She said, we do know. We don't have to do anything like y'all got down there. So I traveled. A 60 mile radius around that corner. I found one Baptist church in a 60 mile radius. I found nine towns with no gospel witness at all. And here I am, sitting with my 200 penny words. At first, trying to explain to God why I can't do it. And then God brings me back to the scripture. I don't want the little lad doing my work. God told me to go do it. So this year, next year in July, for the first two weeks of July, I'm going to go up there. And I'm going to take and spread a table before all them people up there, the 200 folks in two towns up there that don't know the word gospel witness. And here I am sitting with a table. Oh my. God give it to me to do. I can pass it up. Let the little lad do it for me. Walk around with 200 penny worth of change jingling in my pocket. And it torment me day and night. I can do what God's called me to do. Don't seem like much, Lord, a little old mountain boy like me. Out of Mills River, North Carolina. Why you would choose my home out of the six billion people or more that live on this old world, I don't understand it. Lord, if you're going to choose us to do that, Lord, give me my 200 penny words. Lord, if he could bring the gospel to nine towns so that they can hear the gospel for the first time in their life, so they know that they can get saved by the grace of God, that's exactly what I want to do. But I'm wondering who's hindering the work of God in me this morning. Because you won't give God what God can give you. 200 penny words. Not sufficient. You're right. The man's right. But 200 penny worth sufficient in the hands of a body God. We would just give it to him here this morning. Do y'all really want revival? Do we really want God to move this week? Then let's give him our 200 penny words. And let's see what God could do this week. Because I don't want to hinder his work of what he's wanting to do. It may be your grandson, your child, the individual sitting next to you. It may be their week that God wants to save them. But you're trying to argue and discourage and just disappoint and all the things going on with that. Just say, well, what I got, well, it's not enough. It's enough in the hands of God. I don't want to hinder his work. Let us stand. Where's my pianos?
Somebody come play the piano, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. I might have Brother Coates come. I don't normally do the invitation. But everybody, just bow your head, close your eyes, please. And just somebody come play the piano, please. Just come, sister, that's fine. I don't want nobody looking around, please. I've got a piano. Everybody head bowed, every eye closed, please. I want to ask you. If anybody be in here just be honest with God and say, Preacher, I, I've really doubted and discouraged about this revival. Saying, Oh, it's just another meeting. Would anybody raise your hand and says, Preacher, I've done that this week? See the hands. Thank you, sister. Other hands. I see the hands. Church. Are you even doubting that God can send a revival? You say, we're just a little old congregation up here in the mountains. Lord, I don't know if you can do it up here. Has anybody ever just said that this week and really haven't prayed for it like you should? Anybody raise your hand just to be honest between you and me? I want to ask you, church, who's holding the 200 penny worse in here that God's wanting to use? Why don't you just come to the old-fashioned altar up here? Preacher, if I come, they'll know. I'll come with you. Because be right honest with you. I need to get right beside you. 